Uh, so yeah, this talk, we're gonna get a clear understanding of what airflow is and isn't. We're gonna talk about common use cases for airflow. We're gonna talk a bit into how the airflow cluster is built. A lot of this will actually come out more when we're going to use uh, the different parts of that, so we're not gonna go super deep into it. Uh, we're gonna talk about lots of places where we can improve it. One of the things that we're not gonna do is we're not gonna go into a deep dive of airflow itself. So I originally had like 20 extra slides that talked about all kinds of things like XCOM, the CLI, the operator configuration, etc. And it was boring. It was so boring. <laughs> I don't want to do that. We'll probably have a chance to actually talk about those things when we're actually doing the contribution and everything. So I skipped out a bunch of stuff that you probably would see in another talk that I think is just better for us to be interactive. So if it looks like I'm missing something out, maybe I am, but also we could just be trying. But again, ask questions if you think I'm missing anything. So the backstory for airflow. Or a lot of people are actually a little bit confused about what airflow is. So I always like to describe it as a super duper ultra mega really awesome call. <laughs> you guys familiar with Kong? Yes. Yeah. It's basically if you were going to take Kong and make it really much more uh, But more generally, it's a workflow schedule where we might be very complicated. And a lot of the abstractions that they built in airflow, I think, were the right ones. It's really crazy. The choices that they made and how correct they seem to be. Uh, Airflow's timeline, way back in the early days, around 2014, 2015, there were two different projects. Facebook had a project called DataSwap. LinkedIn had a project called NASCAR. Uh, DataSwap was the one where you could write your DAGs in Python. And those DAGs looked a lot like what you would in an Airflow DAG. Like and Azkaban was also a workflow scheduler, and it had a really neat UI that went by. Zoom in and tags and A bunch of engineers left Facebook and LinkedIn and Airbnb and basically said we want our tools again and we're cool. And so Airflow started developing specifically a gent named Maxine, Maxine Bouchon. Uh, he was at Airflow, he was at Facebook and then went to Airflow and uh, Airbnb and started developing Airflow there. Uh, Airflow, Airbnb names all of their projects Airflow. <laughs> Around 2016, uh, Airbnb decided to incubate or give the code to the software foundation. We're going to talk a lot more about what incubation is, uh, but that's basically what they said. Hey, we want to do this Apache partner. I have. I was working at a startup called Opera, and I happened to be sitting on my desk one day reading about Airflow, Luigi, Pinball, which are a couple other ones from Spotify. And I got an email from an old friend of mine on the Samsung project saying, hey, we're going to incubate Airflow, we want to mentor it, uh, which is basically the help of the process. I'm like, cool, you know what which workflow you need to offer. So we deployed that, started working with it. Uh, the incubation process in Apache can take a certain amount of time. Uh, that's basically where you're going to have to be a, a really Apache type project. It took us uh, two years to go through it. That's, I'd say, a little bit longer than normal software they uh, So, but we've been a top level project that means OnCloud, or Hadoop, Spark, Hive, and all the good projects you can think of since 2018. And we very recently, in the last couple of weeks, released version of our end of the And we're releasing things that are really good projects. One of the things is that I've never seen a project, I've been working for about 10 years in Apache now, I've never seen a project with so much at Hotchin. So cool. uh, I spent a bunch of time on this graph and then realized it only went up to 2000. <laughs> really annoying. But they want like 80 bucks to graph. Uh, I will build a tool to actually do it. Uh, but we actually have on the readme.md in GitHub in our repo, we have a uh, file with a list of all of the companies that would like to on themselves. And there's up to about 400. And basically, by looking at the commit date on them, Themselves. And this graph just gives you I've never seen from this graph, uh, which gives us our first area that you can help with. You said if your company is careful, you can definitely go ahead and add it uh, to that list. It's alphabetical. You can do that today if you want. Uh, but yeah, this airflow has gotten so big so fast. I would say that every startup that I have talked to, whatever capacity wants to use, is using Airflow. 
It's also been adopted by a lot of great food companies. Airbnb, of course, is using it. The biggest one I can think of is PayPal. Thousands of bags. Capabilities of it. Uh, Airflow or PayPal CTO, is it or not, is one of the PMC members of the Airflow. So he's been very cool. Uh, we're also a very active project, which is good. We have right now 103 active pull requests, which on the one hand is great, because people want to contribute. On the other hand, it's horrible, which is keeping folks merged. This is something that we as a project have not actually done that well on. Uh, we have let a lot of patches not. Get merged. We've basically been inundated with too many. This is something that we're fixing right now. We've actually using that a bunch of committers. Um, but unfortunately, it is true we do have a big backlog of patches. Nine hundred twenty-two committers is not bad at all. Airflow is much more. If you're interested in a very active project, uh, the other thing is it's quite kind of hard to do. But we're a very friendly project. This is an email for welcoming our newest reader who came in last week, Felix Liebenbach. Uh, you can see everybody's jumping in and congratulating him and saying hello. Uh, this is a very healthy act of community. Uh, part of it is because we have just such a broad and diverse group of people. Uh, some projects have like a single company, most of the community have that. Uh, we have a ton of different companies represented, a bunch of people that were not involved in Apache before this. Now, Airflow seems just randomly to have a very large European contingent. We have a lot of committers in uh, Poland, and, uh, the Netherlands, and Germany, and France, which is really cool. Uh, very friendly community. They've been concerned before about uh, getting involved with them, I guess. This is the project. I don't necessarily want to compare that to something like either Spark or the thing, but it's not just really, really big. Super busy, bunch of companies behind them. They're all very nice people. It's just as a small community, it's very, very different. I think that we're doing a little bit So, let's talk about important airflow concepts that we're going to be dealing with. The core concept is the DAG, the directed asynchronous graph. This is a collection of things that we want to get done, and we want to have airflow for us. Um, the DAG is as operators, every little box there is involved. Operators are connected to the chain. Operators basically have a relationship that says one must come before or after the uh, you can that you can actually generally you can make this more complicated. Usually these lines mean that the operator before has to succeed before the operator after will be run. However, you can actually change that and you can have operators that would run as fails. Even if everything is fine. Uh, what you'll want to do is like error in the cases. So by default, the only way that section one, task one, and the other ones are going to run is the start instance. That means that you can start to build really complex models. This is where the power of Python comes in. And then these first class language starts to put this stuff in. Um, ask them, which is our job, is going to go back at LinkedIn. Uh, you define all of your DAGs using Java property files, which don't have groups, so it's really, really hard. Uh, by having Python there, you can make things that uh, are basically not like And the DAGs are made out of operators. Operators do something, pretty much anything. Uh, operators have an init method and they have an And then the uh, arbitrary method that they want, hash operators, and SQL operators, and slap operators. They all pretty much do exactly what they uh, Once you start working with Airflow, you'll probably start writing operators pretty quickly. There are a few important ones that are worth knowing. We have a Python operator, which is where you can just pass in the same Python method. You always have the option of building a custom operator if you do foo. But if you don't want to do that, you can start a method that does foo and wrap it in a Python operator and say, go ahead and call it. So here we've got text, we get the function of arguments in the block, and then we build the Python operator, and we say we give it the name, run some arbitrary Python, put out the context, and we get all the extra information that everyone knows about. And here is uh, the name of the method. So when this operator gets activated, we have a line, just change the text. It's attached to something. 
the branching operator, this is basically how you can have your statement inside of your head. The branching operator means that when it runs, it will do some method. It's going to return back as its value the name of the next operator to run. So, for instance, if you wanted some logic where you said we're going to run one operator first day of the month and another operator every day of the month, we could basically use the branching operator. It's going to call and check to see if we're going to be the first day of the month or not. We are going to say the next, one, the next operator should be called monthly or it should be called daily. This is how you can make the data. You can accomplish kind of the same things by using different schedules and everything, but this is often not just. It's a There's a whole bunch of operators that are called sensors. These operators are basically Pauses for some condition, whether that happens to be uh, to be to happen. Now we have a bunch of them that are building. S3 key sensor. So in this one, you basically give it the name of some key on S3, and the operator when it comes up, you will pause and uh, clock there until that key appears. H key sensor, it will repeatedly make a call, waiting for a two hundred back response, and one will back forward until it happens. SQL sensor is one we use a lot. This is where you can basically some SQL to execute, and it's going to at this poke people. So every 30 seconds, it's going to go run this SQL command against a connection that you give it, and it's waiting for basically that command to come back with zero hooks. As soon as it does, then it will go ahead and succeed and allow the day. A lot of times, this this one or the SDT sensor will be using ETLs to wait for some data to show up. We're we'll waiting for somebody to put some external data in. As soon as that key shows up, we'll see the query there. And these always have a timeout associated with them, so that this will go ahead. If nothing happens in 30 seconds, we will uh, send up an error condition. Not that there are lots of sensors, and you can write your own. Uh, the other one is the dummy operator. Everybody thinks that this is really stupid until they start tags. But the dummy operator does nothing except to actually group together different logical parts of the tag. So, for instance, here they're doing some work, uh, doing some stuff out of staging. So they tie that all into this one. And then they go and talk to a hub, and then everybody after that is doing this hub. You could directly do the connection of all of these staging operators, all of these hubs so that everybody is depending on everybody else. But it's just a lot easier to basically say, everybody get down here, and then you can go. The other big thing that this does is it lets you like, start from a particular section. So if you need to restart the job, just hub down instead of having to close the You can basically take out staging on everything. So dummy operators. Cool. Uh, and there's lots and lots more. This is just for well, what? Uh, this is where we actually talk to all kinds of things. We're talking about Athena, all kinds of GCP stuff, Mongo, SQL, Verga, Spark, S3, There's a GitHub repo of like, contributed ones that Uh, we have hundreds, thousands of operators here that we've got in these cases. Uh, these are all packaged up in this kind of So let's talk about use cases. So I've seen this. This is what happened in our startup. This is what I've seen. It always starts with business analysis. So I always have a bunch of SQL. Basically, one, they say, hey, we want to put the users in the funnels, we want to do A-B test results, we've got a database, we want to do this every single day. So the nerds come along. That's <laughs> us. <laughs> By the way, this is from a TV show called The IT Crowd, which is the greatest TV show ever in the history of the world. I think. Uh, 
um, the nerds show up. So immediately what we do is we put all of this. You write a quick Clown script called run SQL. I should say that. Uh, we take their SQL files, we tell it to run at 2 o'clock in the morning every single day. This works for three days. Until they decide that the business folks decide that they want to have more SQL and more complicated SQL. So we've got new things that have to run with each other, uh, have to run for each other. And so at that point, what the nerds finally start doing is they take all of this and they write a Python script. They switch over away from Bash. Yeah, we'll start writing something called Yell Runner, Yell, or EQL. This Python script exists. And it gets worse and worse. All of a sudden, this thing starts failing in the middle of the night. You have logs, and some servers someplace. You cannot retry. If you want to retry a certain SQL query, you are commenting out other parts of it. I've done this. I've done this. It's very, very bad. Instead, what we've got is an airflow. And in airflow, you can do all of those same things. This, this script will basically take a bunch of those sequels that they asked for, and put them in here, with responding to any test results. The, the top will come back to that, so it's basically day to day. And we can go through a loop and we can act with a SQL operator that goes and reads that SQL file from there, gets a SQL operator, and mess them all up. And then that dependency where they say user funnel has to run after the moment they use it, they're able to just express here. So we can say, any of those SQL operators, we've got one funnel. And we're going to say that it is upstream of uh, This is usually the first airflow bag that gets deployed. So, um, the neat thing is that that ETL.py or whatever that your script is called can't do anything. So here we're going to say, who owns this? This is not quite data. We want this job to start running on 2019, the third day of May. If something fails on here, go ahead and send me an email. Uh, if this something fails, we just try to try three times. We go to the option to send out that email. Depends on past. This is a little feature that says you have to run out of previous days before we do this one. We want to do this as like we're building up. Executive calculations. The neat thing is that if you set depends on past false, and you have like a bunch of dates to get through, therefore a lot of data. Uh, the queue business ETL, this allows you to basically give certain amount of resources so that the ETL is not going to wipe out everything machine learning is trying to do in terms of resources like server or whatever. You can set up an SLA. If this is not done in three hours, it is going to throw an exception because Fail, execution timeout, which is fine, which is an hour, something wrong, which fail, and this message. You get all of this stuff for free. This is just from your very first ETL. Everything that you're going to kind of hard code at ETL.by works for some questions. All these are required. Yeah. Now, the only thing that's required is to, the DAG ID is required. Um, Right. Well, so here's actually one of the interesting things. And you don't you do this at work, but it actually schedule interval is not even required. So I always call this super mega ultra con, but you can use this for things that you don't want to be scheduled, and then you can just manually take it off. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm not actually sure if besides DAG ID, anything is required. But if you've got some you know one-off script and you want access to all the connection and all of that. You don't have to give one of those. You can just use it. Um, you don't use that at Lyft, but at our place, we can. If you have a script to write, you can write And so, what that ends up looking like something like this. All of a sudden, you've got that very complex relationship that we're expressing. This is a guy with a heavy sensor. Using. Um, this is really good. This is just the first thing to do. After that, you can sort of put more complex things, you can sort of tune it and all those things. Uh, bringing us to our second area of contribution. Because everybody starts to write this as soon as they get airflow and they're replacing all the business needs, I think that it would be really cool if this was built into your class. Yeah, I agree. 
give you know, some examples. Maybe it's a Everybody doesn't have to do it. There's not a kid for this, but everybody keeps doing it. It usually means it might not even actually be 12. A couple of things about what Airflow isn't. Airflow is not a screen processor. Some people try to use it like that. Airflow is pretty high latency. If you were scheduling something to run, a minute is the minimum. But if, I would say five minutes. If you need it to run more frequently than five minutes, I would probably go look at some screen processor. Uh, a lot of this is just we're not built. I was never really going to be. Some of it is also side effects from the scheduler, which we'll talk about. We had, uh, back at Opera, we had a DAG that had about 10 operators in it. We needed to run every 15 minutes. So because of how long it takes to actually get something scheduled, she's getting everything. That was fun. We just could not get a 10 minute DAG. Uh, this is definitely for workflow engines. We need to just show them through the data. We need to show product. Uh, the other thing is, is it's not MapReduce. It's not a G4I. It's not something that goes ahead and takes some arbitrary amount of data, evenly splits it up, assigns it to the computer. Uh, Airflow is expecting the bag that you find to be pretty static. It only checks for changes when that file is changed. So if you say, I want 10 operators, you're going to get 10 operators. And it's not going to try to hash that data or anything. Uh, we ended up with several different attempts at doing something like this back at Opera, and they all ended up It was a while to run up with some here. We had like a machine learning framework that was just horrible. Ended up, we basically tried to do it. We ended up with like 1,600 parallel operators oh, running like, and a certain machine learning. We learned from our mistake. It looks like a MapReduce problem, just put it in MapReduce. And you can still kick that off. You can still have an airflow job that is kicking off that. You don't try to embed the code in the pipeline. If at any point you find yourself hashing on the other way, you can go to uh, The other thing is one of the things that we found is it's really important not to put too much processing in the airflow bank. Don't burn up. If you have a few of the CPU instances that stuff to do, use airflow to start off a DC2 instance. Because all of those airflow workers are all sharing the same box, and they don't do really. Airflow itself is pretty good. It's just trying to keep on the box. The way that most people will go about interacting with airflow is the web interface. Uh, just a quick walk through that. We're going to get a bunch of chances to look at it. Uh, is really this is the main page. This is all of the airflow tasks and all of the airflow bags that you got. This is really nice. Here you're able to actually determine whether or not this is running or on or off. So if this is off, you just need to get scheduled. But well, something really important to understand about airflow is if you tell it to run every single hour and you tell it depends on pass or there's another one, when you turn it on, say you turn it on the next day, it will have 24 hours worth of runs that it will try to immediately start scheduling. The airflow is really good at doing these backfills, catch ups, or whatever. So, this is how you can stop a DAG. You just have to remember that if you told it to catch up and do the work that it missed, you can just try to The name of it is a schedule. These are all cron style stuff. So, 00 zero, zero, social star, you can also do hack data, Who's owning it? This lists all of the runs for the different operators. It's a little confusing. These two columns look pretty much the same. But this is saying that. This has, say, six operators in the DAG, and they all six see them. The green, light green means that it's running. Uh, gray means that it's um, queued. Black, I don't black it's uh, there's also red for failed, orange for you try. This is when it last ran, and this is an actual run. So if you say run every hour, this would be able to run five, five hours. And again, a succeeded is running, and then red is failed. Um, there is some DAX that trigger when a request is here, like a webhook. 
No, there's an airflow is basically only scheduled for uh, only for schedule drops. You can simulate that by using the sensors though. Um, but that's like a one time thing. Yes. Wait for some data and then you run. But that's something that you would probably want to use. Uh, that's yeah. This is not a really an interactive system. There are ways of there are hacky ways to kind of make it do that better. Uh, the other thing that's really cool is the graph view, which we've already seen. This lets you go ahead and play more with this. But every single one of these you can put in. This tells you all of the different operators that you're seeing. They're all different colors. So we have email operators, hive operators, so like high stuff, hive partition sensor. This is a sensor we use a lot at Lyft, and it basically waits for a partition inside of hive to appear. Give you some more. Presto check operator, that's where we run some it's Presto, and if your is okay. Subdag operator. Subdags are evil, don't use them. Subdags are basically where you can have a gag. They've been buzzing for a long time. Uh, I was told they're fixed now. Now I don't But we'll see. Uh, and again, green success, light green running, fails, and no stats. Uh, and we're going to go to the who's spend a lot of time on this. Help wanted. This, the web interface has not been updated for a long time. We really need help with all of this stuff. If you get a really big gag, this will actually freeze it. This whole thing needs to be rewritten to be much more performant. It's awesome that we have it, but after like four years, it just, if you put up an operator, a DAG that has 10,000 operators or something, you can do it. It'll eventually go. Sometimes it'll do the wrong thing. It's stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the big things is that it actually puts a lot of work on no. No. Uh, I think that it should be a lot more um, scalable. However, this this I don't think has really been changed. So it's not built for like giant in there. We don't really have anybody on any contributors that are going to want to do this. You guys like what? So what's the help there? What's <laughs> that? <laughs> that's that's why we don't have anybody using what we want. <laughs> so what's the help there? Like make it faster, make it faster, make it more scalable. If you've got a deck and that's got like a thousand, that's a thousand. Yeah, yeah, it's just that one. Because and you'll see when you actually play with it. Uh, if you click on any of those tags, you get a very really good little box that lets you say, I want to actually run this thing. I want to run it, ignore all the dependencies, so just run that one operator. I want to run it regardless of whether it succeeded or failed. I want to run it whether it's just this particular dependency. So you can clear it so that you're basically deleting it from the brain that it ever ran it. And Airflow will, next time it works, it'll be like, oh, I have to run that egg. So these are kind of subtle differences, but this like literally deletes the you can manually mark this as successful, everything before it, everything after it, everything below it, the gag, downstream. This will all make more sense for seeing more this. And you can also find a bunch more information about the logs. The view log, the ability to go and look at the logs for one of these things that run is, I think, worth airflow's entire. Because there's no logs scrolled away on some server or something. Everybody spends a lot of time capturing footage. Uh, you can also go and look at a particular DAG from the tree view. And so, what this says is there's like four parts of the DAG. The first part is latest only, it's kind of weird. latest only, and then reset out the folder operator, generate export, and upload to S3. And basically what that shows is the success or failure of each one of those operators over time. So this is one that's running every day, and the overall DAG has exceeded each day, except for these ones. On those days, the front end generate export failed. So it gets marked in red. And because it failed, upload to S3 never ran, so those are white. So reds failed, white is didn't run, um, green has succeeded. 
And pink is skipped for some reason. So remember the branch operator? This is probably something where like, we don't need to use. And then also retry, queue, more status. Queue is going to have enough resources to join it then, but it's just okay. Uh, and this is basically how you can see the help of the DAG. This gives you a big, this can use a bunch of love over here where you can click in it so you're on the same part of it, uh, click down so you can see the information. There's, this is not particularly information. Let's see a lot of requests for help on the website. And the, the first one is like a summary of the others, the downs, or? So if everything succeeds, then the whole DAG run, that particular phase run, gets marked as successful. But if anything fails, that whole day's run is hard to spend. We can tweak that if you need to. So, like, so because everything succeeded on May 7, that whole day was more successful on May 7. Because funding generated for fail, that whole day is not um, For example, if everything is pink, uh, it'd be hard to get everything being pink. But this, for some reason, it got skipped. The most likely is because these were added later. So probably on these days, when this uh, guy was running back on April 23rd, these operators were only part of it and they changed it later. So these were just skipped and didn't count. So mainly the first one is only red or, or green, right? Um, it, yeah, it would only be red or green. It's not that, yeah. Everything else could be a different color if you're trying them. Remember the retry setting in that bag? Yeah. yeah. If you bring that, you don't have enough to actually not have any cues, and no status is just being needed. So if it's retry and then retry, then it's going to be green. So if it's retry and then successful, it's going to be green. Okay. Yeah, retry is not there for that long. It's just in the state between failed and running. Let me show you that one in a second. Uh, the duration view. This is basically telling you how long each of these operators took over time. This is really useful for seeing if the DAG is taking a really long time. It's and so, for instance, a bunch of operators here. Um, this is saying this operator took 3.72 hours this day, 2.8 hours. Um, and that just basically lets you show how long. Uh, if things are slowing down, you can usually do that. Yeah. This is this is one of my pet peeves. <laughs> is that if you have a bunch of operators, what happens is this actually wishes up the graph to give you a list of all the operators on it. You literally can't see This has been fixed and working and fixed and working. Uh, I don't know if it's <laughs> Uh, again, this is all four-year-old web stuff. <laughs> the Gantt chart, I love this. This basically shows you each one of these is a different operator that I had to blur out because it's going to have great charts. It basically shows you how long they're taking. And the neat thing is it also shows you the parallelism. So these three operators are the same time. And then they probably, sure, they were all dependent. So this one thing, these all got kicked off if you were to basically move them off. Uh, this is basically some of the which I'm charting the database. The details view, I love this one. Uh, this tells you all kinds of stuff. So that in this particular case, we've had 60 fail runs on this particular bag. Removed, I have no idea what that means. Uh, success is data is successfully run 1400 times, upstream failed, so something above it failed, and so it's a few times. I want to schedule max active runs that basically says how many runs of this data should be running at the same time. So we're trying to do a max fail, we only want to run these one at a time. Concurrency, if you have an uh, if you have a DAG with like 500 operators in it, we will only run a maximum of 125. This is basically so that you're careful with this. Walls by one bad day. Mm -hmm. uh, default args, this is all the stuff that we passed in, you know, and all of that. That's passed here. 
task counts. This is how many tasks are in there. These are the names of them. Where it's located on the file system. It will be more interesting when everything is not for that. This is a real good place to use it for stuff. And that's the, um, the interesting part to what you have. Any questions? Uh, maybe it's not for you, guys, but it's tax force like um, concurrency, concurrency stuff. Like, uh, so each of the each of the operators themselves are running completely independent no. Python process, probably on a different machine. You can certainly do multi-threaded with the operator. However, you usually want to get your concurrency. Because the operators are running multiple to an executor. And so if you have one operator, it's taking off. You can start off. So uh, it's kind of the same story as like Fiji or Spark. You want to get your parallelism to the framework itself by having the operators and then parallel, then trying to have that at the operator. Because then that's the schedule we have the framework level. So let's talk about what goes into an Aeroflow cluster, uh, and the short answer is quite a lot. Um, there's a bunch of components that we need to talk about. Uh, the first one is the web server, that's the one that's serving up the web UI that we just saw. This is a stateless mask application. Um, this actually does quite a bit, but it is too much right now. Uh, it does a lot of talking to the back communities, which are still lots uh, and this is where you can do all of the things that you're just talking about. Uh, the fact that it's a stateless mask application is going to be it's going to spin off because the web server takes up a lot of CPU. Um, probably the most CPU I've ever used. All of the stuff that we saw was being rendered. I don't think any of this is being rendered client side. So, so these tend to be the bottom line. I'm very happy with it. This is a good place to have the rest. So we can definitely do something like that. That's a recurring thing in the bunch of projects, especially with infrastructure stuff. You can track the data geeks, and you can have a track the human geeks. Uh, there is a backing database that we're working with in the demo, and this stores the state of all of the different bags. Uh, did they run? Did they succeed? Hey, yeah, okay. Well, that is cool. So we're just going through like uh, how Airflow is set up and everything. Uh, so it's got all of the state for all the tag run, and we saw that that's successful, failure, and everything. This is all getting updated from the web server and other things. This database can get pretty big. Uh, I remember wandering into work like one Saturday or something, and we were checking it, and our work wasn't on, and we had like 99% of our database. So, this is definitely something you want to get alerts on. Um, managed solutions and um, RDS, all those things are going to be all about your specifics. But there are ways in these are uh, compatible with support by. And which type of database is uh -huh. uh, MySQL, Postgres, they all goes through SQL Alchemy, so I think that would be really helpful. I'm not sure. Um, I've always run it on MySQL or Postgres. So if I want to create like another table, can I use the backing DB or should I just spin up another database? Yeah, I use the backing <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of some company that might have done that. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you basically want the backing DB to be by itself, right? Because if something happens to the backing DB, you have to isolate them and pause extra load on it. So that's good. One of the things that we did at OfferUp was we spun up a pre-replica of it because it is interesting. It has some interesting that knows that. But I would not try to do that. We're just going through like the structure of the uh, the scheduler. This is the thing that we are going to uh, talk quite a bit about. 
And this is the one that says, oh, you guys need to run your job every hour. You need to go through and kind of type it, figure out how much you actually put the documents on them. It actually sends off the commands to run jobs. Uh, to the next part, which is the workers that we'll talk about. There are two ways to write a scheduler. Simple and reliable, but full of features and plugin. We went with full of features and plugin. Um, we have, you know, depends on tasks, concurrency, priorities, teams, tools. You can make your scheduler do kind of anything, um, which is really great, except that it's been not well tested. This is done in the And I have come to Python to use the late line. I was a Java installer guy before I started being careful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I don't think I'm going to get much argument saying that Python is the wrong language for a schedule. Because that's where you really want performance, correctness, testability, uh, schedulers are all about state transitions, and I love Python, and it's a the approach to whatever, it's not really rich. There's a really cool blog post about how we secretly introduced Haskell, and it's these guys that have a scheduler that sounds just like what Airflow was, and had all the same problems, buggy and slow, and taking it too long, uh, and so they rewrote in Haskell without telling anybody that they employed it, it worked perfectly. I'm not saying we should rewrite the schedule in our hands. I'm saying we should rewrite the schedule in our And this has actually happened to me. Is it possible to rewrite the schedule at this point? Yeah, it is. Um, and actually, but um, Uber already did it. They actually rewrote the scheduler in, Pi in Java by calling it Piper. And they have not been willing to open source it yet. Piper? For an airflow, they just rewrote the schedule. Because basically, the scheduler all it does is right now it's actually parsing that whole file. Is it on, the, on like every 30 seconds or something? It goes and looks at all of the DAGs and directly parses it to build out the structure of the operators and their dependencies. We have an open ticket. We have a big discussion right now going on about basically taking that parsing function of what the scheduler does. And putting all that information into a database, and then the scheduler can just read from that database. So you really, for performance reasons, you really need to get the scheduler out of the business parsing um, and trying to figure out what that is, and just in the business of what's next. To it. One implication of the fact that it reads through that whole all of the database for like 30 seconds or whatever is that if you have any third party dependencies that you brought in, NumPy, TensorFlow, whatever, the scheduler has to. Because at the end of the day, scheduler needs to know the structure of your day and when you want it scheduled with all of those priority rules. So I would love it if somebody's would pay me just for a year to go over here something much more testable, much more. I think that to scale up to like PayPal, Microsoft, to this scale, we're going to be really successfully do that. We're going to have to. Other conversations. Other conversations about rewriting the schedule? There's a bunch of tickets, and then there's the one about persisting the DAG into a database instead of the schedule. Because now, like, there are a bunch of folks that work from time on the floor. Not a bunch, but students. Not yeah. all of them are there. So yeah, I just want to be more concerned about the thing called Strong. And Astronomer is trying to be like the cloud era of Polymer's data games. And they've recently hired several of our committers, which were kind of full time. So yeah, if big changes are going to come, um, I have not been super involved in these discussions, but I know it's happening. We're just going through like the flow and structure and everything. Call on questions as we go. This is going to be super interactive. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the scheduler is uh, for a long time. I'm not making this up. We don't have it anymore. But when I started with Apple, the recommendation was that you restarted the scheduler every couple of hours to basically fix the status. I don't think we, re we recommend that anymore, but it just shows you how. Buggy the system is if your replacement for cron is recommended that you have a cron job and you start. So definitely um, 
I rated it as a three on the difficulty scale because scheduling was really cool, and really fun, but also really difficult. Uh, finally, we've got where the actual work takes place. Uh, Airflow basically puts when when something is up to be run, you can schedule it as a particular operator, creates a task instance that's it's actually running, and it puts it on some kind of a message queue where it's picked up by our workers. Right now, it's usually done by salary uh, and using RabbitMQ. There's hosted RabbitMQ and then basically just scale out. Um, you can scale it, you can add more workers. However, it's not as seamless as it should be. You have to change like, configurations, you change the scheduler and everything. It would be great if you were uh, a bit more auto scaling in that regard. Uh, but yeah, we rely heavily on RabbitMQ and so we do. So that's the whole whole questions. Uh, and really quick on those executors, we have the stellar executor, which is one of There's a local executor which is used for like testing. I've never really used this because the Docker it's just like something out that I'm not sure I trust it was locally. And the local executor has the differences from the other executors that I can use at this point. I like to see it with it. Uh, and there's a lot of work being done right now to airflow and to Kubernetes. Uh, stronger than company that we were mentioning is a really robust Kubernetes support for this, which I think is interesting. Everybody's been with Kubernetes, there's going to work kind of way, and if you have to stand up a bunch of sound workers in the relation. Uh, this is an ongoing effort, so if you're interested in all of the managers or any of this stuff, this is a good question. Uh, there's one of the folks that are going to be around about this. We're very good at it. That's a great place to be. And in terms of like getting all of this running, we're going to do Breeze. Breeze is covering a lot of this stuff with our new testing environment. But what people do generally is there is a Docker Airflow that's run by a gentleman named Huggle. I don't know who this is. He's actually not. He or she is not actually a contributor. Some person that's developed these really cool block images. They've got uh, 1300 ports, 1600, almost 1700 stars. This is how we ran it back in uh, script. We just took these, these Docker Compose and spun everything from there. Puckle uh, keeps them very well updated. So if you're looking at deploying, don't try to stand stuff up in the school space. And that's everything that I've got for this talk. <laughs>